welcome back to my channel. Now I am back with my Marvel series, watching it for the first time. So basically, as of right now, I've seen everything except WandaVision, The Falcon, and The Winter Soldier, which is obviously phase four. And the last bit of phase three, which I haven't seen, is the last Spider-Man movie. And obviously, you guys, there are like 11 movies in phase three. So I was like, this video is going to be far too long if I do all 11 in one video. So I'm going to be doing the first five in part one, and then the last six in part two. So let's just get into it. I have so, so much to say about Marvel. Phase 3, probably my favorite. I feel like every movie was so, so good. So I, I can't, I just can't wait to tell you my opinion. And by the way, if I continue looking here is because like the past videos, I've written my notes for like how I felt and like what I thought about each movie. Because obviously, dude, there are 11 movies. You think I can memorize every single plot and know what I like and don't like? No, I'm not God. Anywho, let's get into it. Okay, so phase three started off with Captain America Civil War. Now, I feel like this movie had a lot of mixed reviews. Some people loved it, some people hated it. I am part of the camp that I personally fucking loved Civil War. Like, I could not wait for the Avengers to go up against each other because I feel like even in Avengers, you know, Age of Ultron, you see the cracks start to form within the group and you see the divides start to happen between, you know, like Steve Rogers and Iron Man. So I was like, ooh, I was like, I know what the Civil War is gonna be about. So what did I like about it? Now, I loved how this was the first movie in kind of like the whole Marvel universe that actually addresses the destruction the Avengers caused to like the towns around them. Like, hello, they dropped Sokovia out of the sky onto people and they died. Like, people need to talk about this. So in Wanda, like, you know, moved that explosion onto the building and killed a bunch of Wakandan people. I was like, you know, someone, I mean, they need to, they need to answer to somebody, you know what I mean? Like they, I, I mean, I understand they're saving a lot of people, but they're doing a lot of damage as well. So when the whole Sokovia Accords were introduced, I knew it was coming because like, hello, international relations student, if a body is getting out of hand, then you obviously have to, you know, be able to monitor them, know what they're doing at all times, be able to, you know, like give them consequences if they, you know, mess up. So I was like, Sokovia Accords, obviously it was gonna happen. Now, personally, Personally, I feel like it was very selfish of Tony to sign because I feel like he only signed onto the Accords because of everything that happened in Age of Ultron and he feels like he was responsible for like killing all those people and everything like that. So I feel like that's why he signed on. Personally, I would be totally with Steve Rogers on this because I feel like, you know, I mean, the UN is a great international institution, but it doesn't do everything in its power to help all humanitarian causes. I mean, that's for various reasons. Take like the Rwandan genocide, like they knew about it ages in advance, but they didn't do anything about it and so many people died, you know? I mean, the UN doesn't always do what it should be doing due to various reasons, you know, like different countries make up a lot of the funding of the UN. For example, the US funds 70% of the UN. So I mean, you know, countries' interests and their like their motives really play into what the UN does. So I feel like, you know, all countries have their own agenda and their interests. So being an autonomous superhero, especially when you are as righteous as Steve Rogers is completely fine in my opinion. I was also completely living for the romance between Vision and Wanda. I was like, yes, it was so not forced. And I was like, of course you guys are in love. Like, I love you guys together. And then it hit me, I was like, I see, so that's what WandaVision is. The show is obviously gonna be about Wanda and Vision, but at this point, after watching Civil War, I still thought WandaVision was a movie. I didn't even know it was a show. I didn't even know it was a show. Something that was also kind of unclear to me was the whole brainwashing of Bucky. And as soon as the helmet Zemo found the book and, you know, was like, oh yes, I can finally like brainwash Bucky, I, I didn't really understand the relevance of the book but obviously later on it became clear to me also did anyone notice helmet 
is the same guy, the same actor who basically plays the main like doctor in The Alienist, which I've also seen. Great show, by the way. But if you haven't seen it, definitely watch it if you're into like dark shit like that. I also love how this was the first film we got to properly meet the Black Panther and T'Challa. Obviously not in the best way, like man's dad literally got bombed and killed out here. But at least now I know like what Wakanda is and what it is in like the international sphere. So I was happy about that. And I was like, I'm excited for Black Panther. Next, you know me, I hate forced romances. And this whole romance between Sharon Carter and Steve, I felt was so forced. Honestly, I feel like Black Widow was just kind of egging him on and kind of wing womaning him to try and, you know, like have a romance off to Peggy. But isn't it kind of fun that he was into Peggy and now he's into his, her great niece. Like, is that not weird? Is that not weird? I found that weird. I also loved the fight and chase scenes between obviously T'Challa, Steve Rogers, and Bucky and Butcheress. But I was like, I was very surprised because I didn't know the abilities that the Black Panther has. So when he was fighting with them in proper like, kind of beating them, I was like, okay, like the Black Panther is a very strong superhero. I was like, okay, okay T'Challa, I see you. The last thing I was like, ugh, when Bucky basically got put into prison and then brainwashed, I was like, oh my God, is the whole like next part of the film gonna be like trying to catch Bucky back up to like what's actually going on and like kind of breaking him out of this brainwashing. But thankfully that did not last long because I was like, I can't do this all over again. You know what I mean? Like he's already brainwashed. We already went through this. I don't need this to be a plot yet again. And also when you hear about the other frozen winter soldiers, I was like, it's actually game over, especially because Bucky wasn't even the best one out of the winter soldiers. I was like, these people are literally gonna get beat. I also loved how this movie introduced Spider-Man as well. Like Tom Holland as Spider-Man is so bloody cute. And I loved how casual he was like during this big Avengers standoff fight at the airport. I was like, what are you doing vlogging this right now? And obviously I feel like it was such major fan service for the fights to take place, you know, between one side of the Avengers versus the others. And you know, it's it was fun because if these people really use their abilities to the fullest, like people would have died in this fight. So it's very clear to see that yes, the Avengers are fighting amongst each other, but like no one is trying to kill anyone. Otherwise people would have died. You know what I mean? And I loved how Black Widow like let Steve escape at the end because they basically became besties after the Winter Soldier. So I was like, hello, Natasha, that's Steve, help him out. And also, Really, honestly, after Vision shot down the Iron Patriot, I thought Rhodey was dead. I was like, there's no way, like, he's paralyzed from the waist down. He's definitely not getting, you know, that spin-off sequel movie of his own. <laughs> That's over. <laughs> also, the biggest revelation to me, the biggest plot twist that I never saw coming was at the very end, where Helma basically exposes the fact that Bucky was the one that killed Tony's parents, and Steven knew about it and didn't tell him. And I didn't understand why Tony was so surprised that Steven didn't tell him because I mean, if we're talking about where Steve's loyalties lie, they're definitely with Bucky, not with Iron Man. Like 100%, like that's been his best friend since childhood. Like he is going to be on Bucky's side no matter what, no matter how many people this guy kills. But honestly, Civil War was such a solid start to phase three. I loved it. I also thought it was kind of bittersweet that Bucky goes to Wakanda at the end. Like I thought he was just gonna be like stationed out there and kind of hiding. I didn't know he was gonna go back to cryogenic sleep. That was not explained properly. But yeah, that's what I thought of Civil War. So my pros for this movie was I liked the fact that this was one of the first movies in the whole Marvel Universe where like it's not the superhero trying to save the earth from doom. Like it wasn't Captain America trying to save the world because I mean all the movies have followed that model so I liked the fact that it wasn't about that and it was actually just you know like about inner fights and internal just like internal you know just problems. And my cons, honestly, I had no real cons for this movie. I just really didn't like the Forrest Sharon Carter romance. Like I said, one of my cons was Tony signing onto the Accords just because he felt bad about what happened in Age of Ultron. I was like, this is way bigger than your guilt, Tony. Get out of this like, I'm the main character of this movie mindset. But all in all, I loved Civil War and I gave it an 8.5 out of 10. Sue me. 
I loved it. On to the next movie, which is Doctor Strange. Now, I fucking love Benedict Cumberbatch, so I had really high expectations for this movie, and especially because Julian said he loved Doctor Strange, so I was like, okay, maybe I'll like it. But he also loved Guardians of the Galaxy 1, and I hated that, so I was like, he, I probably am not gonna like this movie. Every movie he likes, I don't like it. So I was like, this is this is gonna be awkward. <laughs> so let's get into it. Now the star fight, the starting essentially scene between Kaecilius fighting the Ancient One and all his little minions, I was like, this movie is like Inception on methamphetamines. I was like, what is going on? Like, I had no idea what was going on. Like, and also side note, I had no idea Mads Michelson was in this movie. I was like, I love him. I watched Hannibal, like I love everything he's been in. Actually, okay, side note, story time. I actually saw him at the airport once and I fully recognized him and he was coming back to Canada and I was like, oh my God, that's Mads Michelson. And I was like, should I say hi? And I like, I was just starstruck. So I was literally just staring at him, kind of trying to figure out if it was him. And he looked at me and we both made eye contact. And then like, he kind of had this recognition that, okay, she's recognized who I am. And then he kind of smiled at me in a way that like, please don't like make this a big deal and please don't like come up to me so I was like okay you know what like I'm not gonna come up to him and make a huge scene that the celebrities at the airport but I was like oh my god he's right there <laughs> anywho fangirling over now I have some problems with Stephen Strange as a character I felt like it was very hard not to hate him because he is so arrogant and especially when he experiments on his hand and none of them work and then he shouts at Christine even though it's not even her fault and I was like you're a dick like, who does that? Like, she's just trying to help you, Stephen Strange. Secondly, I feel like any time I see Tilda Swinton, who plays obviously the Ancient One in any movie, she automatically reminds me of when she played the White Witch in Narnia. Like, I feel like any time she plays sort of like a mystical role, her facial expressions don't really change that much. So I, I found a lot of similarities in her performance as the Ancient One and as the White Witch. I was like, we need more range here. And that's me speaking as an actor, not even as the audience. The mirror dimension and the astral plane was crazy. But, and, and Stephen Strange going through that when he first arrives at Kamertage, I was like, wow. But also going into the astral plane and the mirror dimension, that really reminded me of when Ant-Man like Scott goes into the quantum realm because there was so much like traveling through like all this stuff and I was like it was very cha chaotic and it reminded me of that and I I liked I also liked how this man was not good at magic straight off the bat like he was actually quite shit at the beginning and he had to learn to be really good at it and obviously I mean he does become really good at it like one of the cons for me for this movie was the whole Dormammu dark dimension thing it was just very whatever I wasn't fearing it I wasn't really excited for it like I just wasn't super into it I was like yes okay this exists this must be the evil thing that they're gonna fight in this movie but I was like like I wasn't I wasn't into it and when the reveal happened when we actually met Dormammu at the very end I was like this is what we're scared of Really? And I also, I feel like, I feel like the Cloak of Levitation was my favorite character in this movie and it wasn't even a character. Like I liked seeing how he got the Cloak of Levitation and you know, going back to the hospital and scaring the shit out of Christine, coming out of the astral plane and she's like, what the hell did I just see? Like I thought that, how casually that was done was really funny. And my last note, I guess for the movie was even when the Ancient One died, I really wasn't that sad about it, nor was I emotionally attached. So I found that this movie was was very hard for me to kind of become emotionally attached to. In my opinion, I didn't love it. But hello, let's let's talk about the pros first. So what did I write in my pros? So like I said, Cloak of Levitation was my favorite character in the movie. The most cute and like comedic character, I think. And also the end credits with Mordo killing Pangborn, I was like, is this a new villain alert? Like in the Doctor Strange sequel, I'm sure there's gonna be one. Is he gonna be the villain? Because there's a lot of foreshadowing right now. Now onto my cons, because there are a lot of cons that I had. Honestly, regardless of everything, I thought the movie was just slow. Like it, the plot was very slow, for example, at the point where Doctor Strange kind of takes over the sanctum, I actually looked to see how much of the movie was left and it was like 40-30% of the movie was left and I was like, we just went through the whole movie just for him to become 
the head of the head of the sanctum I was like this movie is going so slow I thought this was all backstory I thought this was like you know like 20% of the movie and we're gonna go go into something bigger and better but we actually just didn't um so the backstory took up more than half the movie which I wasn't that happy about Master Wong as a character was low-key very annoying but I let that go I also didn't think the ancient one using the dark dimension to sustain life was a very big deal. Like, I didn't know why everyone got so butthurt and betrayed over it. I was like, well, how else did you expect her to fucking live for like a billion years? And last but not least, I was genuinely disappointed in the end fight. Like, I absolutely loved, you know, like the time going back and trying to fix everything. But honestly, like how Doctor Strange fixed the whole thing was him going to this dark dimension and getting killed by Dormammu a billion times before he finally got sick of it. And I was like, that was how the movie ended. I was like, that's like, there was all this build up and the climax wasn't even worth it. So for all my reasons, I actually gave this a five out of 10, nearing on 4.5 out of 10. I was not impressed. But you guys, now before I get into the last three movies for part one of this video, I just wanted to shout out Skillshare for sponsoring this one. Now you definitely heard me gush about Skillshare before, but if you haven't, it's basically this online learning community that hosts thousands of different classes on topics like illustration, graphic design, and so on. And the best part about it is it's suitable for any skill level, whether you're a noob or a pro. Because I personally am my own boss and I run my Myself as my own brand. I recently took the class called Going Freelance, Building and Branding Your Own Success, taught by Claire Wasserman and Justin Genag. And I feel like this class really helped me solidify my plans of where I want to be in the future and where I want my brand to go and exactly what I want it to represent. And sort of it kind of teaches you how to authentically network because that's something I find very hard. Networking, I feel for me, is very awkward. So so I highly recommend it and honestly the one of the other best parts are that there are no ads like thank you Skillshare and thankfully the first a thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your own creativity you're welcome on to Guardians of the Galaxy volume 2 Okay, you guys, unlike Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, I loved number 2. It was so much funnier. It was so engaging to watch. I, I loved it. Honestly, I loved it. Because I feel like now that I'm more into the universe, I like the fact that we can take a break from what's going on on Earth and see what the hell kind of shit is going on in space and see what the situation is like because everything's so intertwined. I actually love it, honestly. Now, the opening scene where they're fighting and the music is playing was hilarious and it was so cute like I love the fight in the background with baby Groot just dancing and being in like an all-around baby eating random shit off the ground that he shouldn't be and Rocket just taking it out of his mouth like what are you doing you tiny baby honestly I love baby Groot I would die for him he's so cute now I know I said I didn't love Rocket in number one but I'm starting to like him a bit, but I still don't understand why he stole those batteries. I was like, are you just stealing shit just to stir shit? Like, what are you doing? And when we first are introduced to Ego as Quill's dad, I have no apprehensions about him because he's Quill's real dad. I was like, hello, he's offering you a literal planet and a father figure, go with him. I was so naive, I was, so, so naive. Don't talk to me about it. The whole taser face joke, I feel like it was very overdone. Honestly, it wasn't even funny. And when the Ravagers staged a mutiny and kidnapped Rocket and Groot and started like kicking and taunting baby Groot, I was like, you touch him and I will kill you. Like, they were kicking him and throwing stuff on him and I was like, he's just a baby. Leave him alone. And Nebula, there's something I just love about Nebula. Like, I've never seen someone so dead set on kill mission after kill mission so i was like this girl has perseverance and we like that we appreciate that also just the fact that baby grew it was so forgetful and when you know rocket and yondu are trying to get him to get yondu's like head plate and he keeps bringing back random stuff and they've explained it to him so many times i just found it so cute because like that's what babies do like they don't know what you're talking about like even my cat like it's just a baby she doesn't know anything so i was like this was just so funny and so cute and it was so badass when they finally broke out of there and yondu's like red arrow is out here killing all these people i was like yeah you go yondu even though i'm not even the biggest fan of him but i was like you go yondu 
Yondu. But the fact that Yondu was exiled from the Ravager community was new because I had no idea there was even like a huge Ravager community. And then you find out he was exiled because he stole Quill and all that. And I was like, you had one job just to not steal the kid. And you couldn't even do that, Yondu. And also, so when I found out Ego is a celestial or a planet, I was like, so what, Quill is half human, half planet? I, I was I was sort of confused. And the revelation that Ego kills all his kids was a mind blowing. I was like, obviously it was too good to be true. Like, and the fact that he gave Quill's mom the tumor because he loved her so much and oh, if he went back to visit her, he'd never leave Earth. I was like, you are a psychopath. You are a serial killer. How dare you do that? And I was like, Quill, this man needs to be killed immediately. Immediately. I'm like in this one sliver of light right here. Honestly, I think the final battle scene was done really well in my opinion. At least, I mean, evidently the stolen batteries came in clutch at the very end, so I guess go you rocket for stealing them. And I love how the whole operation essentially was on Groot's shoulders about pressing the right button. And I was like, this is baby Groot. Do you really think he's gonna do it? Like I knew he was, but I was like, no, he's like so confused all the time. Like I hope he presses the right button. I actually thought that when everybody left the planet and it kind of exploded i genuinely thought quill was dying with ego on the planet so the fact that yondu saved him and like that was actually emotional that genuinely touched me and like the ravager funeral was just impeccable honestly so my pros for this movie was it was the plot line was great it was so much funnier and it was so engaging personally all the interactions between mantis and drax were hilarious like he is so mean and upfront to her and she just doesn't even take it as an insult she, she just laughs and i'm like he's the she saying that you look disgusting and she's like thank you i was like this is so funny and also i was like was i the only one that sent some sexual tension between them two like i hope that becomes a thing later on in the movies and i actually liked how the sisters gamora and nebula finally actually got along because i was like guys don't hate each other hate thanos and I also liked how this one wasn't romance focused because we love that. And my cons for this movie, I didn't have a lot of cons. Honestly, I thought Yondu's death was so sad, but I was like, why would you tell him in that moment that he saved Quill? Like, why would you have not told Quill growing up that like his dad is killing his kids and so I actually saved you and protected you? Like, I don't understand why Yondu wouldn't just tell him that. I feel like common sense in this world is just, you know, it, it could have fixed a lot of this world's problems. All in all, I gave Guardians of the Galaxy 2 8.5 out of 10. I thought it was great. On to a Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, since it's not on Disney Plus, I really, I really didn't want to miss it. I thankfully watched it on Netflix. And in terms of Spider-Man, I've seen all the Tobey Maguire ones. I saw the first Andrew Garfield one and the Tom Holland one got so many rave reviews. So I was like, I hope it's good. And honestly, I loved it. Like, I think Tom Holland plays Spider-Man so relatably and he's so casual and it's like, it's really hard not to fall in love with him. Like the movie was great. It was funny. The plot was like nice. It wasn't world ending, but it was so engaging. Uh, honestly, I don't know why the human world is so bad at dealing with alien weapons and shit. Like, just get rid of them. Give them back to Thor so he can take them to space. Like, don't have them on the ground because people will use them. And, like, I feel like just Peter as a character, you could relate to him so much. Like, he's this close to being an Avenger. Like, any, like, 17, 16-year-old kid would be, like, chuffed to bits. No wonder, like, he has no plans every single day after school because he's like, oh, what if I have a mission? What if I have a mission today? What if Tony Stark needs me to wipe his ass today? Like, you know he'd do it. This is Peter Parker. Now, what what I was surprised about was the fact that I thought Zendaya would have been the love interest in this movie, so I was very surprised that she wasn't. And it was Liz, and I was like, Liz, this is this is a weak romance. Peter's best friend Ned reminds me of Louise from Ant-Man. Like he's so funny and cute as well. Like his little guy at the desk, I loved it. And the fact that randomly Donald Glover was in this movie, I was like, okay. So many just like stars in this movie all of a sudden. And honestly, I thought Tony was too hard on him after he took on the Vulture for the first time. And it's like, dude, at least he was doing something. Like, what were you doing all this time? Sucking Pepper's ass? Probably. Honestly, the party was fun. The party scene was so cute. I was like, Peter, just become Spider-Man. Liz is into Spider-Man. You're into Liz. 
you are Spider-Man. Everything works out. I also think it was a bit of an overkill for Tony to confiscate the suit after the whole ferry incident because I understand he put a lot of people in danger, but he just saved all his classmates in the Washington Monument. So I mean, there, there are always risks and losses either way. You know, I don't think it should have been confiscated because of that. I thought the final fight scene wasn't that action-packed, but it was still really enjoyable because, I mean, Peter is still nearly beaten to death before he finally wins over the Vulture. And the revelation that the Vulture is Liz's dad, I did not see coming. I was like, oh my god, this whole time! I honestly had no idea. Now, my pros for this movie was the fact that his disappearance as Spider-Man always coincided with his school activities and I liked the fact that it was done really well It wasn't that like the movie just ignored what was happening at school and just followed Peter as being Spider-Man Like people noticed that he wasn't there and like they're like where's Peter and then he comes back with some excuse so I was like, okay, like it's not just like oh, it's conveniently ignoring school time They're incorporating both storylines together and it's working out really well. Also, Vulture as his dad was a huge plot twist to me. I loved it. My only cons for the movie was honestly, really, the whole movie would have been 10 minutes long if Happy or Tony took Peter seriously. Like, he called them, texted them, warned them countless, countless times about the Vulture and nobody listened to him. Nobody took him seriously. And I was like, had you listened, this movie would have been five minutes long, honestly. And even at the end where he's calling Happy and telling him not to let the plane take off, I was like, listen to this boy. He's not just a little boy. All in all, I gave the movie an 8 out of 10. I really liked Spider-Man. Now, you guys, on to the final movie for part one. Look how long this video is already. I've had to film now again because my SD card has already like been filled up. So now onto the final movie for part one of my Marvel Phase 3 watching series. We are on to Thor Ragnarok. Now, honestly, after Spider-Man, I was not looking forward to Ragnarok for some reason because Thor The Dark World was pretty average, but Ragnarok Rock was impeccable. It was probably the best Thor thus far, and I actually loved it. It had the most plot, most storyline out of all the movies, and it actually just wasn't baseless CGI fighting just because they had the budget for it. It was really, really good. Now, the Surtis scene at the start of the movie I thought was very random. I didn't know how relevant it would become later on, but I thought it was a nice start to the movie. I also really liked how Hulk was a huge part of this movie because I was like, I love a Thor and Hulk crossover who doesn't and I was also really happy that the whole Loki as Odin didn't last very long because I would have been pissed if half the movie was Thor not knowing that Odin was Loki so I was really happy that that ended very quickly after Searcher was like oh Odin is not on Asgard and then Thor was like whatever the fuck do you mean by that um but honestly after Dark World I thought Odin was dead so when he shows up later on in the movie and then dies I was like I swear down Loki kills you in the last movie like how are you still alive I also I really liked how Doctor Strange was in this movie because the post credit scene in Doctor Strange was in Thor Ragnarok so I was like hee 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 I was like I recognize it <laughs> I also thought the revelation of Hela was insane how are you gonna hide a whole ass sibling from your kids like Kate Blanchett was such a good villain I honestly thought she could overpower Loki and Thor very easily because when she first arrived and literally just destroyed his hammer I was like shit like none of the Avengers could even pick up this hammer and she's out here destroying it like great we have to be worried right now even think about it defeating Asgard and taking it over was so easy for her and then resurrecting all her dead soldiers and her giant wolf I was like this this is gonna be a problem that wolf is gigantic um I also love the expansion of just the Asgardian world and the introduction of the Valkyrie and who they were and what they did I thought Sakaar was a pretty cool planet as well Sakaar gave me major Guardians of the Galaxy vibes I was so happy when the Hulk came out during the fight because I was like this is Thor's friend! But obviously that that was not how it how it went down. <laughs> he got beat the shit out of. Um, and I also really liked how they explain where Hulk even is because he just disappears after Age of Ultron and we don't really know where he is so I like the fact that we were able to figure out where he's been all this time and I liked how it was explained really well how he has been Hulk for the past few years and he hasn't changed back into Bruce Banner. I was like, 
damn, that's that's huge. Now in terms of Asgard activities, I loved Heimdall being like the on-ground protector and making sure like the Asgardians were taken care of while Hela's like reigning loose on this place. I'm a sucker, you guys, I am a sucker for final battles. I, I, I love a good final battle. I loved how at the end of the film, like the final battle, everything was happening at the same time. So like Hela's on her way to Heimdall and all the survivors, like Thor is trying to travel back with the Hulk and the Valkyrie, like there's so many things going on at once so you're always wondering like okay where is Hela right now where is Thor right now what where is what where is everyone you know what I mean so I really liked how everything was done at the same time and also I lulled when Hulk just refuses to come out and like <laughs> Bruce Banner falls onto like that that like that um that rainbow road or whatever it reminds you of the rainbow road in Mario Kart the rainbow road that goes to the Bifrost thing like how he falls onto it and just splats I was like, really Bruce? This is not what we need right now. The Hulk versus Fenris fight was impeccable. I was like, dude, who doesn't want to watch Hulk fight a giant wolf? No one, everyone wants to see that. And I, I loved how Loki came in clutch at the end with all the other gladiator fighters. I was like, yes, Loki, thankfully you finally become a good guy. I, I thought it was really neat how Surtur, like the fire demon god, book ended the film, he's the one that started the film and kind of he's the one that brings the end, he brings Ragnarok to Asgard and he kind of ends the film as well. So I liked the technique of bookmarking the film. Now onto my crow, onto my crows and pawns, <laughs> onto my pros and cons you guys. So my pros was honestly Kate Blanchett was a really really good villain. The storyline was so good and gripping. I, I also liked how the Hulk part of Bruce had a lot of character growth and he's just not the other version of Bruce that can't really talk and all he can say is Hulk smash. I like how he is actually has his own personality and he's a person sort of now. I also, Korg was hilarious. Like, I have had a lot of Kiwi friends in my days, so Korg was just a breath of fresh air in the universe and I thought he was so funny when like the ghost of Loki comes and he <laughs> And he was like, take that, you fucking goose. And I was like, oh my god, like, you're just hilarious. I loved him and I loved the fact that Jeff Goldblum was also in the film because that guy's iconic. Now, my only con for this movie was one for tour Valkyrie. I feel like she should have been a lot more on board with helping Thor sooner. Like, at the end of the day, like, yes, a lot of your Valkyries were killed by Hela, but, like, you are an Asgardian and this is Thor, the rightful king of Asgard, asking for your help. Like, you damn well help him. All in all, I loved Ragnarok and I gave it an 8.5 slash 9 out of 10, you guys. I was in love with Ragnarok. And yes, that is me you guys. Part two of phase three is coming really soon. We're gonna go into Black Panther, the last two Avengers, obviously Captain Marvel, Ant-Man and Wasp, Spider-Man Far From Home, all that good stuff is gonna come soon. So uh, stick around for that. But let me know out of this half of phase three, what was your favorite part? Do you agree or disagree with any of my opinions? I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Let me know in the comments below. As always, I've been the very newly appointed Marvel fan, Eamon, and I will catch you in the next one. Bye!